Priya, I, I want to start with both the markets and interest rates. And for someone who's coming in and looking at it today, we have the markets basically back to where they were um, at near all-time highs at February levels. Uh, on the other side, we have interest rates, which have remained low and are going to remain low for years. So which one of these is mispriced in your opinion? Right. So I actually don't think that there is that much of a disconnect between the two markets. What sort of squares the circle is the Fed. So we have the Fed coming in with a very dovish message over the last couple of months. I think because partly they are concerned about the virus resurgence, maybe we have a second wave. Partly they are extremely concerned about structural damage that may be done here. Certainly on the consumer confidence front, it's, it's possible that there has been some of the structural damage, but particularly on the small business front. You know, if, if a store goes under or, or you have a, a pickup in bankruptcies in restaurants and hotels, they're not hiding those people back. So I think the Fed is concerned about this longer term risk and therefore is, is telling us that they're going to be growing the balance sheet for a long time, which uh, sort of keeps the long end uh, contained. They're going to keep rates here for a very long period of time. So, you know, there's this reach for yield. If, if investors have savings, where do they invest it? That's why the stock market's doing well. You look at credit spreads, it's done well. So I think the market's essentially telling you we're in this holding pattern right now where the Fed is keeping rates low. I do worry about risk assets if the Fed's fears are realized, if we do have a second wave or if this new normal that we're reopening to, if that's a much weaker growth outlook, then I think some of the gains in, in risk assets may, may struggle. But it's too early to sort of say that. So I wouldn't say that right now is the time to get out of risk assets. But the rate side, I think, is just telling you that central banks globally are being very, very accommodative here. I think they just don't want um, any reason to sort of increase the structural damage by allowing interest rates to rise. Well, you mentioned, you know, it, it's, it's early to tell. And I know that you spend probably a lot of time watching data, but I'm sure the types of data you're watching are different than the data you used to watch before. So what are you watching? Right. That's a fair point. In fact, the market's not reacting to a lot of the economic data that we've looked at. We had awful data in April, but I think the market said, well, let's look a little bit longer term. That impact of, of data in April was because of the lockdowns. Now we're seeing much better data. But again, can you extrapolate from the data going forward? The, what we've been getting right now, I would say no, because we're seeing the reopening. So instead of usual economic data, which I have to say as a rates person, I do not have to look at, but we're looking at things like the virus curve, you know, uh, positivity rates, is there any sign of the second wave or are different countries, different states in the US, are they able to flatten these curves? So we're certainly looking at the virus curve. And then we're looking at things like Google mobility data, uh, Apple mobility data. What we want to understand is, are people heading out just to go to the parks, which is actually what's happening right now, or are they going out to spend money? It's still a little early because parts of the country have not fully reopened. New York City reopened, just reopened. So I think if we start seeing people actually going to restaurants, going to stores, credit card data, that's another thing we're looking at. I think we've all had to become more creative in terms because we've never really faced a pandemic like this well since the early 1900s uh, in order to see how does the the consumer react? How does the business sector react? I think we'll have to look at this data apart from the usual economic data until we sort of get a sense of, you know, what's the impact on, on the psyche of, of, of the American consumer. Are you seeing anything that would lead you to think that we could see inflation pop up its head? I mean, there's so much liquidity in the market. The Fed has done so much. So any concerns there? Um, so certainly from the investor side, I am hearing that concern. It's a little similar to what I heard in 2009 as well, because the Fed balance sheet grew a lot. We had a very high fiscal deficit as well. So if you think the fiscal side is providing money to the system, the monetary side is providing money. You know, if you're a student of economics, more money chasing same goods, it tends to be inflationary. It didn't happen, though, in, in 2009. In fact, one of the things the Fed has been saying is we had very good growth pre-COVID in the U.S., and yet uh, inflation didn't even reach their target. So there's something structural going on. I sort of liken, you know, a lot of people have, have sort of talked about this pandemic as being like a war or a natural disaster. I think there's one very big difference between that analogy and, and, and COVID. If you look outside the window, the capacity is still there. We're not using the capacity. There's been no destruction of output. So, you know, when we go back into the world, there's going to be this excess capacity issue. So I think that's going to overwhelm this money chasing assets. I think you can get financial asset inflation, 
But for real inflation to show up in the economy, I think we need a boost in aggregate demand. And we just talked about how demand might be getting impacted by the confidence shock. I'm not sure that the fiscal side has done enough to create more demand, it, you know, demand for, for real goods and services. So we're less concerned about inflation. And I will highlight that the Fed is telling us they are happy with inflation going above target. This is actually very different from what they told us in 2015. Actually, the Fed reaction function was the same as it is today. They wouldn't even have hiked in 2015. So I think they're happy to let inflation run. But I, I just, from a fundamental standpoint, just don't see the inflationary forces at play. Interesting. What about the, the Fed? And if I could throw in as well, if you take a look at 10 years, what you're seeing, um, you know, we've heard from the Fed, they plan on staying low for a while, but you've got uh, your own thesis on how long that could actually be. Right. So the Fed has told us through the dot plot that they don't expect to hike until the end of 21. They don't forecast anything beyond 22. So, uh, but, uh, you know, we do forecast going far out. We actually don't have the Fed hiking until 2024. And that's assuming no virus second wave. If you do get a virus second wave, I think the hit to confidence is much more. So then they could be on hold even longer. Um, but when you talk about the tenure, I, I thought I'll just bring up this. Certainly the, the, the tenure is impacted by what the Fed does on the front end. But the tenure is also, I say, more impacted by what they do on the balance sheet. They've bought 1.6 trillion of treasuries just since mid-March. So as long as they keep buying, and our forecast is that they will be buying at the same pace until the middle of next year, and they'll be buying at a lower pace until the end of next year. Now, the Fed has not made that forecast, but this is our own uh, forecast with our economists. If the Fed is buying so much in treasuries, it actually puts a cap on the tenure as well. So I think there's both the force of the balance sheet and what they do on the front end, that can keep the 10-year. I think if we see better data, we can probably get close to 1%. But I struggle to see the 10-year in the U.S. go above 1% all of this year or next year. One last quick question, if I could. Um, we have the U.S. election coming up. I mean, that could do all sorts of things. I mean, how does the market price something? Or what is what, what do you think is being priced in right now? And, and what do you expect to see as rhetoric starts to really ramp up and, and we get closer to the date? Right. Great question, because normally I would have said if there was no COVID, the market would be pricing in the election right now. I think there are just so many variables. We're pricing in the economy. Do we get a second wave during flu season? The election is around flu season. Um, and, you know, is this election a, a referendum on President Trump? So I think the market really doesn't know how to and doesn't typically like to price in political risk because they, you get extremely binary outcomes. But I do think if it, that the market right now is priced for President Trump re-election, because that just uh, sort of keeps that uncertainty low, because we know what you know, his policies are going to be. If it looks like, and certainly in the last month, it looks like Vice President Biden's um, uh, chances are improving, I think you could see some pullback in risk sentiment. You know, whether what you know where you are on, on the political spectrum, it just increases uncertainty. So I think the market's going to want to take a step back and see what exactly are his policies before you know that that sort of run can continue. Priya, great insight. Such a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.